when you're a lawyer, sometimes you may have an occasion where there's an opportunity to talk to the opposing party without their lawyer present. And we have a rule about that. ABA model rule 4.2 basically says you're not allowed to do that. You can't go behind opposing counsel's back and try to deal directly with their client or like to negotiate a settlement of the case and cut their lawyer out of it. And this will apply even if they contact you. If you pick up the phone one day and it's the opposing party and they say, I'd like to talk to you directly and see if we can resolve this without my lawyer, um, you have to get off the phone right away. You're not allowed to continue the conversation. So that's the basics, but let's dive in and look at the provisions of the rule and uh, so that you know how to handle this when you get a test question about it. So model rule 4.2 has only one section and it's here on my screen. In representing a client, a lawyer shall not communicate about the subject of their representation with a person the lawyer knows to be represented by another lawyer in the matter. Unless the lawyer has the consent of the other lawyer or is authorized to do so by law or court order. Now, you could have situations where, let's say, both of you represent, you and opposing counsel are representing two large corporate entities. It could be a transactional matter, right? A joint venture that you're trying to um, hammer out or a merger or acquisition deal. And the opposing counsel has said, oh, if you need information like, about our board of directors and their names, full names and addresses or something, just call the human resources office at my um, client's uh, business and they trust you. And there's the trust that you're not going to try to manipulate the person or uh, do something like that. And this is pretty common, right? Where you would have authorization. It's less common in litigation uh, situations. But why would a court authorize you to do this? Well, it's rare, but once in a while, let's say opposing counsel becomes unavailable. They're unresponsive. They just stop answering the phone or responding to emails and texts, um, either from you or maybe even from the court. And at that point, you could petition the court for if, if their own client, if the opposing party also says, I haven't been able to communicate with my lawyer, um, the court may authorize you to just deal with them until their lawyer resurfaces. Again, as you might expect, this is very rare. I mean, it does happen from time to time. Okay, let's talk about a few of the comments that I think could pop up in a multiple choice question on the MPRE or my final exam. Rule 4.2 applies even if the represented person from the other party initiates or consents to the communication. And so a lawyer must immediately terminate the communication with a person if after commencing it, after you start talking, you realize that the person is someone with whom the communication is not permitted by this rule. So let's just say you're in your office one day working and the phone rings and you answer it. And lo and behold, it's the other party. And they say, look, I think my lawyer is being unreasonable. I'd like to talk to you directly about whether I could settle this case and kind of cut my lawyer out of it. Or I'm thinking of firing my lawyer. Even though they called you, you have to hang, you have to say, I can't talk to you and hang up. And my advice uh, to you would be that your next call should probably be to opposing counsel to tell them what happened, to say, I got a call from your client and I terminated the conversation immediately. So it doesn't seem like you're hiding something. It'll look suspicious if they hear from their own client, oh yeah, I called the other lawyer, but he didn't want to talk to me. It's better for them, I think, to hear it from you. And so even if the other person initiates the conversation, uh, this rule would still apply. This could also be true if you run into the opposing party somewhere in public, in the grocery store or at a wedding reception or something like that, and they approach you and want to start talking about the case because you're right there, well, you have to end the conversation. Now, let's talk about some situations where it doesn't apply. This doesn't apply if the conversation is completely unrelated to the matter uh, for which you're representing one party and they're the other party. And so let's say that you are, find yourself uh, at a wedding reception or an alumni reception and get seated at a table with someone who happens to be the other party in a, a matter that you're handling. And again, it could be litigation or a transactional matter. If you want to just chat about the weather and sports and alumni affairs or how nice the wedding was or something like that, 
that's fine as long as you don't talk about the case. It's risky, right, that there will be a misunderstanding with opposing counsel if they hear that the person saw you and had a nice chat. But this is not as strict as the rule, let's say, about not talking to jurors. So you can't have a conversation during a trial with one of the individual jurors that about unrelated matters like the weather or something like that, because we're concerned that you'll try to charm them. But we're less concerned about the other party represented by counsel, unless you're trying to talk about the matter at hand. They give it a couple of examples here, but um, in the comment where they say, uh, let's say there's an ongoing con controversy between a government agency, a regulatory agency and a private party, or it could be between two or, uh, entities. But let's say your uh, client has uh, is a corporation and they have some a dispute about last year's taxes, tax bill, corporate taxes with the IRS. You could still call the IRS and talk to even the, some of the same people about um, how to, what you're supposed to do with this year's tax returns. It's an unrelated matter. And this is very common where you have a corporate client that has to deal with a particular agency frequently about permits or licenses uh, or regulatory oversight. And you, you might be calling them about lots of different matters all the time. It's okay that you are talking to the, uh, them about something that's unrelated to the matter at hand without their lawyer or without the government's lawyer present. Um, 4.2 also doesn't apply if some random person wants a second opinion from you about their case, and it's a case that you're not involved in at all. This could be a kind of a formal uh, a appeal for a second opinion where the person schedules a consultation and comes in and says, I have a matter, I have a lawyer, I'm not sure my lawyer is doing the right thing or knows what they're doing, and I'd like to, to get your opinion about it. Well, that's fine. Even though you know they have a lawyer, you're not involved in the case. You're not representing anyone in that case or that transaction. And so it's okay. This could also happen in very casual, informal situations. Let's say you're on a flight and the person who gets seated next to you on the flight says, hey, you're a lawyer. Can I ask you a question? Or you're in some uh, out at the grocery store or shopping or running errands and someone says, you're a lawyer. Can I ask you about something? And they have a lawyer and you're not involved in the case. It's completely okay for you to chat with them about um, the matter. Just be careful, unrelated to this rule, that you may be giving them legal advice, and if they rely on that and to their detriment, um, you could be creating a potential issue for yourself with liability or conflicts of interest down the road or something like that. But for purposes of 4.2, if you are not representing anyone in this matter, related to this matter, you can go ahead and pontificate all you want about um, to someone who about what their lawyer is doing. On the other hand, this does apply if you're acting through another person. So you can't get around this rule by asking your secretary to call the other party directly or asking your law student intern to befriend the other person directly. They're acting at your behest. They're basically your agent, and it's the same as if you were doing it. Now, this next part is sort of the biggest exception to this rule, and and honestly, it's one of the parts of this, the comments that comes up most often on the MPRE or on my exam as a multiple choice kind of gotcha question. The, the rule doesn't apply to the parties, it applies to the lawyers. So you as a lawyer can't talk to the other party without their lawyer present or their lawyer consenting in the, or their lawyer on the call if it's a phone call. But there's no way that we can prevent the parties themselves from talking to each other if they want without their lawyer. And so if your client either just calls the other party one day, maybe they've known each other for years, like it's a dispute between relatives over a contested will or neighbors over a property line dispute, something like that. And they get in a conversation and they decide to resolve the matter or work out an agreement without their lawyers. They have a right to do that. And that won't reflect on either lawyer. And in fact, if a client tells you, I want to just talk to the other party directly because we have a longstanding relationship and I think that we could actually uh, work something out, you can advise them that they are allowed to do that. You will probably want to warn them that they... Um, could make admissions that will, or, or make statements that will, or promises that will be admissible if the case ends up 
going to trial. And so you can't, I don't, it's a little less clear that you could actually give them a script about what to say, but you could caution them about things not to do or, and then explain to them that they are allowed to, uh, to do this. And again, if you have an independent justification or legal authorization for communicating with a person who's a represented person, then you're permitted to do that. And so here's our kind of crazy situation. You're pulling out of the courthouse and uh, uh, one day and you get in a little fender bender and uh, lo and behold, who's driving the other car? It's the other party and their lawyer is nowhere around for some reason. Can you exchange insurance information and things like that as long as you don't discuss the case? Of course you can. Again, in practice, you should probably let the other lawyer know what happened so they're hearing about it from you instead of their own client. But if you have some little incident or you um, where you have to communicate with the other person without their lawyer present, and it's not about the case, but you have some sort of independent justification uh, for doing that, um, th then you could. Now, what about when the other party is an entity, like a large corporate uh, for-profit company, or maybe a large nonprofit, like a hospital or a private school or a, a church? Well, 4.2 applies to the person in the, for that organization, the opposing party, who supervises or directs or regularly consults with that organization's lawyer on the matter, or who would have the legal authority to bind that entity in the matter. And so here's an example. Let's say you are representing a plaintiff who's suing Walmart and there's thousands of Walmart stores all over the country. And of course, you're probably dealing with the central corporation, the umbrella entity that's the, the corporation. Well, can you stop by a Walmart and um, check out and talk to the cashier about about you know whether you want paper bags or plastic or um, a cash or credit or things like that. Of course, right? That's a cashier at your local Walmart. It doesn't have authority to bind the entire corporate entity in whatever matter uh, you're representing, and they are not the one who hires the lawyers or directs the lawyer. That would probably be general counsel or some upper level executive for the central corporation. And so that's what we're talking about. There is someone at the opposing party's entity or corporation who gets to hire and fire their lawyers and who could make decisions binding um, the organization and that person you're not allowed to talk to without their lawyer. Okay, now what about former employees of the opposing party? So you're suing, again, let's say you're suing Walmart or suing a some other local business. It is completely fair game for you to hunt down former um, employees and talk to them. And it doesn't, you don't need the um, entities opposing counsel's consent for that. Also, sometimes you'll have base situations where people are kind of co-defendants, right? You know, on the other side or co-plaintiffs, but the individual at that entity has retained separate counsel. They have their own lawyer. Well, whoever is their lawyer is the person who would need to consent to you communicating with them you don't have to get, in that case, uh, consent from the corporate lawyer as well, or the person representing the corporation. So if a constituent of the organization has their own lawyer, consent by that counsel will be uh, sufficient for purposes of this rule. Now, a, a couple final words. This rule is phrased to require knowledge, and knowledge means actual knowledge. So this applies only if the lawyer knows that the person is in fact represented in the matter to be discussed. And that means actual knowledge. Although under the model rules, we could infer actual knowledge from the circumstances. I'll give you a hypothetical. Let's say that you represent um, a business that has a hundred employees or so. And at late in the afternoon, at the end of the day, on a Thursday afternoon, they terminate one of their employees and they have them escorted out of the building. They take away their ID card and so forth, kind of lock them out of the building. And then they call you, their lawyer, and say, we terminated this employee just now. It's the end of the day. It's closing time for our business. But we realized that this person has uh, one of our corporate laptops at their house. So we want the laptop back or some other piece of equipment or some files that they have um, at their home. We'd like you to 
get that back from them uh, tomorrow morning. So the next morning at 9 a.m., suppose you call this former employee and say, hey, um, I, I understand you were terminated. I represent the company. And they believe that you have uh, some of their property, like a laptop or some file folders or something like that at your house and we need them back. It's reasonable for you to assume that someone would not have retained counsel by the very next morning if they were terminated at the end of the day. So it would be okay. You would not be a violation of this rule in that situation for you to call the person and try to talk to them. Now, if a few minutes in the conversation, they say something like, well, I'll have to talk to my lawyer about it. And you realize that they have already somehow hired a lawyer. Maybe they knew that the termination was coming and they um, preemptively hired a lawyer a couple of weeks ago. But as soon as you realize that, you are supposed to get off the, you should terminate the conversation. Say, oh, I didn't know you had a lawyer already. Have that person call me and get off the phone. So at that point, you have actual knowledge and then the rule would require you to terminate the conversation. We had an ABA ethics opinion, formal ethics opinion 502 that came out in 2022 about this rule. And it's specifically, it's about a very specific scenario, a pro se lawyer. But you could see a question, one question maybe about this on your MPRE. So I'm just going to give you the main point. If you are representing yourself as a lawyer, and that happens sometimes where lawyers are pro se, then the rule still applies to you. You don't get to uh, contact the opposing party without their lawyer. Let's say that they have a lawyer if you are um, just because you're pro se. So a pro se lawyer may not communicate with a represented person in the matter about the subject matter of the representation. Um, it, again, they need you need to have their lawyer on the call or present for a meeting or the consent of their lawyer. So 4.2 will apply even if you are pro se. And that concludes our lecture about ABA model rule 4.2.